so that you're all aware. Um, so for the agenda, what we're going to do is we're going to kick this off with a high level discussion. Um, we've got a, a great um, range of voices just uh, giving their perspective on, on this, this kind of change and, and why now. Um, that's from a range of organizations you'll have seen um, on the agenda as well as cross-party voices. Um, unfortunately, I think our Labour representative hasn't been able to join us because of um, rural broadband issues, um, but otherwise we've got really good um, uh, representation. Um, and then we're going to move on in, in the sort of second half into a roundtable discussion, getting a little bit more into some of the technical considerations um, of this change to the Companies Act. So, Let me kick things off. I'm going to hand over um, and start with our, our very own Douglas Lamont, co-chair of the Better Business Act campaign to, um, to introduce us all to, to what we're talking about. Douglas. Brilliant. Th thank you, Chris. And just a very warm welcome to what, uh, looking at the screen today, is an incredibly diverse bunch of people from across the political spectrum, but also from across the business spectrum. And I, and I think that's a really important point for everybody that, you know, that, the Better Business Act is something that is drawing together people from from all walks of life and all types of companies, you know, driven by a purpose that we, we need to make a change. I, I, I think the, the broader context for everybody is, you know, we've all been asking ourselves, what does building back better actually mean? You know, other than a phrase we can all remember, how do we make sure that it is something tangible and actionable so that we really do make accelerated progress to a kind of fairer and more sustainable future and and for us that's where the bit of better business act comes in you know it's it's a very clear ask from business uh, to, to government to say how do we reset the foundations of how businesses operate you know for, for too long shareholders have been the you know the absolute focus and priority of people and that as we know and there's been a lot of dialogue on it over the last few years has been at the cost of people, of workers, of society, of, of the planet. And, you know, the evidence is building that the right business models are ones where we align the needs of all stakeholders, absolutely shareholders, shareholders and returns and profit are absolutely central to this. And I, I know as a business leader myself, how critical that is. But we also know and, and can see that making sure that that people and planet in balance is the right way to run companies. It's not, it's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And today, you know, our strong belief is that the Companies Act is at, at best vague and slightly confusing. At worst, it's a hiding place for those that want to justify why they're profit maximizing despite the costs to wider society. And, and so with the four principles that we're putting forward, aligned interest that I've talked about across those stakeholders, making sure that you know the principle that directors are still empowered to make those choices you know we don't want this to be overly prescriptive this ultimately still the principle is that directors get to decide but the, the mindset starts with balancing people profit and planet for want of for want of a better phrase we think this change should be for all companies why because pace is so important you know my strong belief is that business is going in this direction anyway but probably not fast enough. And by making this the default conversation, the default mindset inside companies, we can accelerate the change. And, and boy, do we need to accelerate the change. And, and, and many of you can talk more eloquently than I can on, on, on the why. And, and as ever, making sure that reporting follows, follows this action, you know, for those bigger companies that have to report, making sure that how they're thinking about that balance is, is reported clearly and fairly is, is, is going to be important as well. Who are we? Uh, we're a very diverse bunch and you know, you, you'll have seen the headline brands and great to have companies like John Lewis and Waitrose and Iceland and progressive companies like Bulb and others on board and, and my own company at Innocent. But we've also got lots of really small companies, you know, art, artisan bakers and, and coffee shops, as well as big London law firms and uh, Cornish surf, you know, clothing companies. You know, it, it's the diversity that brings strength here. This isn't just one group of business with a particular interest asking for us. This, this is, you know, what I would like to see as the next generation of business leaders asking to set ourselves higher standards. And, and the time is now, you know, we've got to work out what you know, a better way forward for business, for capitalism is. And we think this is the starting point because it's the foundation. You know, the Companies Act might be quite 
technical, but it is the foundation. So let's get the foundation right, and then we can we can we can build from there. And and in a year where we've got the G7 and we've got 20, COP26, the time is now. You know, we can set the standard not only for UK business, but for global business. And I think the UK has got a proud history of leading in this space. And I think this is a great opportunity to showcase that leadership and, and set an example for the world going forward. But finally, this is the start of the process. And today is not about us saying this is what exactly what we want. It's about us saying this is our passion, this is our vision, but we're here to listen as well. You know, we know there'll be questions. We know there are challenges. There are, there are things that we have to work through. And, and that's what we want to do with all of you. We want to, we want to listen. We want to hear the challenges, uncover them, and make sure that we're working as businesses collaboratively with all of you at Westminster to really deliver this change. Because I, I think there's a great opportunity to do something that we could all be incredibly proud of and can make a massive difference to the UK, to, but, but potentially to the world going forward if we get this right over the next 12 months. So th that, that's it from me for now. Um, I'm gonna hand over to, to Kevin Hollenrake, who is the chair of the All Parliamentary, parliamentary Group on uh, Fair Business Banking, and, and also not only brings his experience as an MP to this, but brings his, his experience you know, as, as a seasoned uh, businessman as well to this. So Kevin, uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Douglas. Um, great to hear your words. And then um, I absolutely believe, both as a member of parliament and a business person of 30 years, that business is a force for good in this country and uh, in many other countries besides. And um, so it's great to see your leadership. Thank you very much for that. And um, you know, I'm absolutely 100% signed up to the fact that business can solve many of the problems you've been alluding to. I will say, as a caveat, uh, probably as parliamentarians parliamentary should do, I think, is I've got some questions as well as support for the basic principle. Um, but it's my view, I say, I think when people go into business as you do, Douglas, and all the other businesses that you'd reference, you think of not just about making money, of course, that's part of the process. You have to do that. You have to get a return on capital. But otherwise, you wouldn't get any capital to start a business in the first place or to grow a business. But um, you think about legacy. And that's, of course, the jobs you create and the, li the livelihoods that you offer people. It's about your reputation, of course, because that reflects on you as a business person. And that kept me awake or when I did when I was awake at night in business, often to do with you know how this would um, how this would reflect on business and therefore myself if things didn't go according to plan. Um, I get the other beauty of business is you get to to live in a world that you design. You can build something in your self image. So it is a tremendous privilege to be able to do that. And I think once you go down that road, you want to make sure you have your legacy involves other thing other than just growth of a business. So that may well be the welfare of your workers. It may be the impact or the positive impact on the environment. It may be charitable contributions or indeed your impact in the overall wider economy because of course businesses, when businesses succeed, there's lots of tax associated uh, with that, corporation tax, but also lots of other things in terms of contributions businesses make. And that all goes to pay for the for public services, which is hugely important. and. We certainly were, despite actually being asked to do otherwise, or, a few, or suggested we might do otherwise, on a few occasions by our advisors, our, our accountants, never went down these kind of uh, convoluted or contrived tax avoidance schemes. For example, we were happy to pay our tax. And I think um, when you look at a business's corporate social responsibility, the first question you should ask them, are, are you paying tax? Because I think that's your first social responsibility, in my view. Um, Yes, the APPG on Fair Business Banking, which I chair, because I have great sympathy with many of the businesses that were poorly treated by the banks following the last financial crisis, 2008, and the aftermath of that. And it, it does show that all is not well all the time in terms of the free market economy, in terms of capitalism. At times, business is guilty of some disgraceful behaviour. And you may well ask that why that was. Why did a bank sue? in the vast majority of cases treated their customers well for decades, some banks, some bankers in some banks 
did not do that. And then um, ultimately there's an element of human nature there, of course, which you've got to guard against. Um, but also I think in feeling that human nature is uh, some, if you look, reflect on the words of Charlie Munger, right-hand man of uh, Warren Buffett, he said, show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. And too often there are incentives for uh, people to do the wrong thing or the, um, the incentives drive bad behavior. So I think we've got to look at this very carefully. And I think some of the suggestions and the Better Business Act certainly look at this more holistically. I also think there's big regulatory failure within that whole space. And then um, I think this is what we look at. Market forces are a force for good, but they need good regulation. And I think it's there has to be a balance between the two things. Um, but I'm very optimistic about the future. You see one of the programs we've got running in the APPG is something called uh, Bankers for Net Zero, how banks help business move towards the net zero transition, uh, uh, carbon mitigation. And we're seeing banks do that through regulation, but also through willingness to do the right thing, realizing they've got a key part to play in this. Um, excuse me. And, uh, and also shareholder action, of course, which is being increasingly important. So shareholders do have a big, a big role to play in this, um, irrespective of whether we rebalance the equation between shareholders and other elements within the Companies Act, in Section 172. So um, the concerns I have, I said at the start, the concerns I have is we've got to maintain a fair and level playing field. Um, for instance, an example, um, some may say off the offshoring of offshoring of the past was the wrong thing to do. That wasn't in the interest of the of the local economies in in terms of employees offshoring jobs to China. Should that have happened? Well, that happened actually because of market forces, and we can't leave UK businesses at a disadvantage. If there are no businesses, there are no jobs, and that is your first, your primary, um, the primary thing that the success of a business leads to job opportunities. I think the other concern I have is if you change the relationship where financial success isn't the foremost uh, objective of a business, um, it leaves potentially open to challenge from lawyers saying if it's this is if it, this is legislation, could lawyers come in and say the business made, the directors made the wrong decision there and challenge that in the court, which would be a potential legal nightmare for businesses. Um, so, uh, so I have concerns about that. The other thing is, if this is going to be all businesses, I think it's easier to, 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 to help on the legacy side of things, to do all the nice things for the environment and your employees when you're successful. the bank. I think I worry, well, will this be a barrier to cut new Ultimately, makes our economy more successful, drives up service, drives down prices. For consumers, so some ambition around a rebalancing of. And that's brilliant and great, as um, Douglas says, to really kind of open up um, the, the the conversation there. As you say, very supportive in terms of direction, but but some really important questions. Um, Moving on now, um, I want to hand over to um, Alan Brown, MP. Um, if uh, we can, we can hear from Alan. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. And it's a pleasure to follow Kevin and Douglas. Um, I'm going to start by looking back at uh, previous employment I had before I was an MP. So at one time I worked for Scottish Water and went to a partnership with contractors in order to deliver their capital program, and Every so often, we would get a, a, a kind of pep talk from the senior manager of, of the partnership. And his opening remarks have always stuck with me. And he always started by, by saying, some say profit is a dirty word, but it isn't. I always felt it was somewhat passive. If you work in the public sector, you didn't understand about profit, but always seemed to obviously me that companies have to make sure it's not just to make no ethics and how to treat people and employees is, is real important. And now more than ever, we all, obviously we know we need to protect the environment as well. And then if you look at the wider construction industry, health and safety and protection of employees is absolutely critical, as is fair pay, um, a, a fair, fair day's pay for a fair day's work, rather than perhaps 
forcing a bonus culture, which actually encourages workers to take shortcuts, and uh, fair procurement is important as well. Then if we fast forward to the, the, uh, the current pandemic, we know the pandemic has shown the best of society and business, but it's also unfortunately provided opportunities for some companies to make money, exploit the taxpayer, and exploit the workers. We've seen British Airways with their widespread fire and rehire tactics, and now British Gas is doing likewise. And also, a constituency led by constituents who work for DA Maintenance, but that, their employment is through uh, an employment agency. This agency actually refused to follow the workers, even though it's confirmed that they could follow the workers because of some absurd fear of building up future liabilities. So, I actually kept these workers on with no pay for a a number of weeks before deciding to lay them off when it came to follow a deadline day. So that was really disappointing in, in how these workers were treated, and clearly there were nothing more than numbers on the page. Then in the abuse committee, we, we've heard of companies that were using government support to actually minimise their debt interest, or still paying significant shareholder bonuses and dividends. And of course, there was supermarkets making increased profits while benefiting from rates relief from the government. Obviously, at least public opinions force a U-turn by supermarkets. So that actually shows the, the power of, of, of that public opinion as well. Um, I'm proud to have grown up in the constituency that I represent. The biggest town in my constituency is Kilmarnock, who actually has a proud manufacturing history. But sadly, unfortunately, most of the manufacturing jobs are consigned to history. And that's what village I grew up in outside Kilmarnock, New Mills. In our neighbouring uh, village, Darvo, they, when, when I left school, they, they'd left factories that still employed thousands of workers. And the employment that gave to the area was massive and also supported other surrounding small businesses. And again, all but one of these factories is gone. Now, it, it might be the majority of these jobs would, would have been lost, no matter if we, you know, we have the Better Business Act. But there's actually one recent standout example from our constituency that was wholly preventable. So the world's top selling Scotch whisky, Johnny Walker, was bottled and blended in, in Kilmarnock. Born 1820, still going strong as a Johnny Walker model. But yet, for no other reason than profit, dressed up as efficiency, the operations was actually moved from Kilmarnock to five by Diageo. So in 2012, that was 700 jobs lost overnight from Kilmarnock. Now, that, that was actually the biggest private employer in the town. So it was devastating for the local community. In terms of people affected, other businesses affected, and really only a global company answerable to remote shareholders would consider such a move palatable. And there was even offer of public investment to help modernisation, but the company still chose to go down that route. So if the Better Business Act prohibits companies from operating in such a way and reminds companies they do have to value its workforce, they do have to value the communities. That the, the employment's embedded in, then that can only be a good thing, and I certainly fully support the aims of this, and hopefully it'll be a successful outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alan. Great to hear from you, and uh, apologies for um, for not giving you a, a full intro there as uh, obviously a, a member of, of, of the Bayes Committee and the Sustainable Energy APPG, so again, with a really um, clear perspective on on these issues and, and appreciate that and I want to hand hand over now to um, to to Johnny Oates who um, who is a uh, he was chief of staff to, to Nick Clegg um, former director of policy and comms at, at, at the Lib Dems and um, Johnny really keen to hear from you as well to round us out thank you uh, thanks very much Chris and um, <clears throat> I'm really grateful to you um, and the coalition uh, for the opportunity to support this initiative uh, as we all know, um, and, and the coalition underlines, we, we face um, particular circumstances, a, a climate emergency and the real crisis of social inequality uh, that we all have a responsibility to try and tackle. And we know that we're not going to be able to sustain our planet unless we tackle the former, and we're not going to be able to sustain our societies unless we tackle the latter. And these issues are really, in my mind, critically linked because the failure to address the climate and ecological emergency will increasingly compound the crisis of inequality. And I think the two together um, are driving an ever diminishing political legitimacy uh, and 
um, diminishing societal cohesion. So um, we got a, a, a real major challenge and we all have to play our, our, own in, our own role in tackling these interlinked crises. And I think it's fair to say that none of us have been doing anywhere near enough of what we should have been doing. Business, of course, is often cast as a villain of the piece, but in truth, it's been acting just like the rest of us. Some good, some bad, uh, some, I suppose, pioneering, others lagging, and, and, and a minority actively ignoring the reality that faces us and willfully chasing short-term profit at the price uh, of both the planet and its people. So I very much welcome this business driven initiative because it highlights the large number of business, businesses and business people around the country who understand that um, truly sustainable business can only be built on the foundations of sustainable societies and a sustainable planet. And as Kevin uh, said earlier, business can be and often is a force for good. But as he also said, it can also be a negative force. And I think if we're going to tackle the um, challenges ahead, we need business as a whole to understand its, its wider obligations. Uh, a Better Business Act could obviously play a key role in transforming UK business by ensuring um, that the duty of directors uh, is shifted so that uh, it, it, it's not only to the benefit of the company, but, but to the wider benefit of all stakeholders. In practice, I firmly believe that would be to the long-term benefit of business itself. And the fact that the coalition is supported by some of the country's most successful and innovative businesses, from long-established companies to, to comparative newcomers, and I should perhaps here declare my interest as a serial uh, contributor to Brewdog's profits, but I think that demonstrates that um, a, a wider perspective on benefits is not to the detriment of business, but actually uh, it can be to its, its definite advantage. Of course, th there's a number of questions um, that would need to be ironed out in the details of the initiative, um, as, as Kevin underlined. And uh, as the Better Business Act Coalition have made clear a change to section 172 is not a panacea. It can't on its own transform the approach of business, but it can remove the excuse uh, uh, of, of those businesses um, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that say that they cannot uh, act in the interest of people and the planet. And it can set a culture or behavior that other businesses uh, will be increasingly expected uh, to, to follow. Clearly, business is going to have to play a crucial role as we seek to address the climate emergency and this crisis of social inequality. Uh, so I really warmly welcome this initiative and also the fact that it has got um, cross-party support. And I really look forward to working together with my, my colleagues uh, in, in Parliament across parties and across the Commons and, and the Lords to to help ensure um, that, that we can help you to ensure it proceeds from, from a bold vision to, to an act of parliament. Thank you. So ju just a quick wrap up from me, because I know we're, we're, we're running slightly behind time before we move on to the round table, but, but first of all, thank you so much um, for, for, all, for, the, for the support that you're giving us in, in the first place. And, and quite rightly, the challenge too. And you know, many many of the the, the, the things that you raise, we, you know, we've been very thoughtful around too. Now, we, we obviously believe that you know what what we're trying to achieve is absolutely the right thing to do. And and we can we can come back and work with you on, on those questions and challenges. But ultimately, for for better business and for better society, we're all going in this direction. This is about pace and, and a clear framework and. and you know, and and as as Johnny Oates just said there, you know, making sure that there isn't a hiding place for people that use the current Companies Act as justification for bad behaviour uh, is one part of it. But going further than that and making sure that just that mindset shift in boardrooms is is there for everybody. You know, ultimately at this level, it's about a mindset shift, and and let's address those concerns. Let's work together 
to, to really give this some momentum in Parliament. But but thank you for your support, and and we're now we're now going to move on to the to the round table. Hi, I'm, I'm Deborah Hargreaves and um, I'm a uh, director of the High Pay Centre. I'm just chairing this round table. Um, we have um, a great set of speakers, um, very well qualified to address this issue. Um, so without further ado, I'll give them a brief intro introduction and then we'll um, pose um, a question to them to start um, to um, give them a few opening remarks. Um, we have um, Dr. Roger Barker, who's the Head of Governance at the um, Institute of Directors, Janet Williamson, who's a Senior Policy Officer at the TUC, and Luke Fletcher, from um, partner from Bates Wells Law Firm, as well as Chris Turner, who you've met already, um, who needs no introduction. So we um, are very pressed for time, so, we, so I would like to ask the panellists to keep their remarks fairly brief. Um, and um, I'm going to put a question to all of them to start off with about um, stakeholder interests. And given that um, survival is the name of the game right now uh, in the wake of the pandemic, well, we hope it's the wake for us, um, are businesses doing enough right now to safeguard the interests of their stakeholders? Uh, so I'm going to pose that question first of all to Chris, um, who um, can kick off the discussion and then we'll be following up with our other speakers. Thank you very much, Deborah. I um, appreciate that. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep this, this really brief um, uh, because everyone, everyone knows who I am and obviously coming right from the sort of heart of this campaign, but and I'm really keen to hear from our, our other, our other um, speakers here. But, but I think if any of you have been to our website, and hopefully you all have or you all will, you'll be met with a big kind of landing page statement that says very clearly, literally in black and white, the world needs business at its best. And I think ultimately, um, you know, my, my answer to this question is rooted in some of the stuff that Douglas has been saying in terms of the urgency of the challenges that, that we face. So... The answer on the one hand is many businesses, yes, absolutely. They are doing an incredible job um, of advancing um, the interests of a wide range of stakeholders. Um, and, and, and that is, you know, with a, you know, whether or not, whatever their line of business may be, and that's whether or not they have an eye to, you know, some of the um, long-term challenges in terms of uh, inequality and social challenges, whether they are really focused on addressing the climate emergency, or whether or not they've been, as you mentioned, um, Deborah, kind of focusing on the COVID crisis and what their response is going to be there. Incredible work is being done. And, and in a little bit, I think um, I'll probably touch on the, the B Corps and the B Corp community who've been sort of demonstrating this over, over many, many years um, and demonstrating that that's a, that is a, a job that can be done. <laughs> you know, this isn't, this isn't a, a conundrum, um, you know, to, to find a way of advancing all of those interests in parallel and aligning them all in the long term. And, and we can demonstrate that. So yes, absolutely in the case of some businesses, but the no side of this answer is they're not all doing it. And in order to really tackle these challenges, some of the fundamental and more systemic challenges that we face, we need all businesses contributing. And it is about establishing this kind of level playing field that we're talking about so that we can ensure that ultimately what we're creating here is a race to the top um, in terms of businesses contributing towards solutions here. So that's where we need to go. That's, that's the kind of wholesale approach that the, the challenges that we face demand. And that's the kind of urgency that we need to unlock through the Better the Business Act. Great, as an introduction, um, I'm gonna to turn to Roger now, Roger Barker, who's been around the governance world for some time and uh, has um, dealt with many different businesses at the Institute of Directors. So um, what uh, what do you think of the stakeholder interest right now, Roger? Um, yes, I think you know the answer to your question, Deborah, as Chris said, is, is some companies are and some aren't. But what I think has changed now is there is, there is a much wider recognition that good stakeholder management and good engagement with stakeholders is absolutely crucial for business. And I think the good businesses will have been doing this regardless of law, um, corporate governance codes or anything else, they will have been practicing 
good stakeholder mapping and engagement and, and uh, an, an approach to business, which really is holistic in thinking about all stakeholders. Um, what I think we need to do now, of course, is to make our company law framework consistent with that good way of, that, of doing business through a pro um, stakeholder approach. And what we have at the moment, I think, is that the DNA of companies, which is what really the Companies Act is, is kind of inconsistent with that more stakeholder oriented approach. Um, and I think it's to some extent that's a historical thing. I mean, company law really emerged to kind of facilitate the relationship between companies and shareholders. And it really wasn't about the company's relationship with the rest of society. That has changed to some extent. And Section 172 was an attempt to bring the company closer to society, but it hasn't really completed the journey yet. It's sort of stuck in an uneasy compromise. And I think that this is the final sort of step in the journey, um, adjusting uh, Section 172 so that it does really reflect a, a pro-stakeholder orientation. And then I think the expectations of society and company law will be better aligned. Uh, great, thanks, Roger. Um, I like that idea that we're on a journey and this is the next step um, in it. Um, Janet, um, Janet Williamson from the TUC, um, could we get your perspective on where we are on this journey? Uh, yes, thank you, Deborah. And um, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation to join the panel today. Um, TUC's campaigned for many years to reform company law and the priority it currently gives to shareholders. So. Um, yeah, I warmly kind of welcome the launch of the BBA and very pleased to be here. Um, I mean, the brief answer to your question is no, companies are not doing enough uh, at the moment to safeguard the interests of their workers and other stakeholders. And, you know, I would emphasize this is not just because of the particular challenges that have been created by the pandemic. These have, of course, been considerable. But even before COVID, the average employment experience, if I can put it that way, had got better, uh, sorry, had got worse, not better, um, over the previous decade. Um, so average earnings were still lower before COVID this is in real terms than they were before the financial crisis. And there's also been an explosion of insecure work in the UK with a sharp rise in workers on zero hours or short hours contracts or employed through um, agencies, therefore breaking the sort of direct employment relationship between company and worker. And I think Adam referred um, earlier to some of the consequences of this. And the vast majority of low paid and insecure workers are employed in the private sector. Um, again, we've had, you know, considerable challenges posed by the pandemic and some companies have done their best to protect their work from the the consequences of the doubt of the economic downturn or covid precautions and um you know we've already had a little bit of reference to employers who are using the current crisis as, as an excuse for what we call fire and rehire to firing workers and re-employing them on worse terms and conditions and I mean, overall, I think what this reflects is the fact that business models are increasingly based on employment models that are exploitative and perpetuate precarious work. What we need is, you know, everybody has been saying um, is that companies should be shifting their focus away from maximizing short term shareholder interests and working towards creating long term sustainable company success that benefits all stakeholders and protects the environment. And I think corporate governance reform and rewriting directors' duties is a really vital part of bringing that about. Um, I mean, as I said, we have campaigned for many years to reform directors' duties and to, to, to change the current um, formulation of shareholder primacy within it. And so, yeah, I kind of welcome further collaboration on, on, um, on this, how to, go, how, to, how to make that change work. Great, thanks very much, Janet. Um, as ever, very pithy. Um, and now I'm going to turn to Luke Fletcher from Bates Wells um, about um, the um, what a business is doing now to safeguard their stakeholder interests. Uh, thank you very much, Deborah. I'd probably um, uh, just shift the angle a little bit to, uh, I, I suppose, the framework that businesses are operating under at the moment. So as a lawyer, naturally advising uh, businesses, advising directors, I'm thinking about the duties of directors in that context and have interaction with boards and the way that they're thinking about these issues. 
And I suppose I would just observe that um, the Companies Act, as it's framed at the moment, makes stakeholder interests a subsidiary consideration. So companies exist for the benefit of their members. That's the default purpose in company law. Pretty much all companies operate on that basis. And so uh, directors have this duty to have regard to stakeholder interests. But the truth is that boards can consider stakeholder interests and discount them. They can uh, choose not to give them particular weight if they think those interests aren't that important in the context of uh, shareholder value. And they might also feel as that, that in order to give weight to stakeholder interests or incorporate those interests into their strategy, that um, in, in some way they need to be able to demonstrate a business case in order to be able to do that. And that can, I think, chill consideration of these really important issues where things like harm to the environment uh, are, are really significant. And, and it might tempt directors perhaps to look at wider practice and ask the question, are we going further and faster than others? And should we do that? Can we do that? Or are we going too far? Might we, um, in, in a sense, be uh, missing some short term value if, if we are too responsible? And so that, I think, is the, the tension that we have with the law at the moment, which I would really describe as a, as a sort of cultural artifact. Uh, I think it's a product of its time. It's uh, framed nearly a generation ago now, and, and the world has moved on. We've had the financial crisis, we now have the climate crisis, and we have the pandemic. And I'd also say that expectations of companies have changed. And we see that in the corporate governance code, which asks boards to establish their purpose and to describe how they benefit society more widely. And that really seems to be the, the, the sort of best practice and the best way of thinking. Uh, but unfortunately, as Chris was alluding to at the beginning, we see a huge variation in practice and the law at the moment uh, allows boards to discount uh, these wider considerations. And, and I suppose what we're pushing for with, with the Better Business Act is to say, well, we need to, to create a new baseline and use that baseline to create the fair and level playing field that Kevin was describing. Great, Luke. Thanks very much. That's really, um, really interesting. Um, and I like that question that you posed there, um, that companies are asking themselves, are we missing short term value if we're being too responsible? Um, so I'd like to incorporate that into a question directed to Roger Barker. Um, and um, this involves whether we can trust business leaders to actually do this um, or will they be worried about this short-term value that um, Luke mentioned? Well no I think uh, a lot of it is determined by the incentives which they're given um, the, particularly the management team and of course a lot of the incentives they've been given especially at large listed companies in recent years um, have been pretty short-term in orientation and they primarily been, been tied to the share price, developments in the share price. So, which reflects, doesn't it, the kind of understanding, implicit understanding that the company is all about promoting interests of shareholders first and foremost. And, and that, that orientation is still very um, widespread. I mean, I still see a lot of companies where um, senior executives are given very aggressive performance targets whereby they can earn huge sums of money based purely on developments in the share price. Um, you know, that's the only performance criteria. You know, forget climate change, forget other non-financial criteria. It's all about that. That's still very much part of, part of the present day. But I think that, you know, the benefit of this approach that you know that isn't those aren't the sort of incentives we should actually be, be providing to executives we need a different set of executives a more broad-based set of, in, of performance criteria which take into account this broader stakeholder orientation i think once you put those in place you have you're going to have a much and, and directors feel empowered to put those new incentives in place you'll have a much better chance of business behaving in the way that you want it to. Of course, we'll still have the, the old fashioned principal agent problem, which is, you know, managers may still be tempted to pursue their own agendas, their own objectives. But, uh, you know, overcoming that is down to having good directors and a good broader framework of, of governments. But incentives, I think, are, are particularly important. Great, thanks, Roger. I like to hear that discussion of incentives, given my um, interest at the High Pay Centre. 
Um, so I'd like to pose a question to Janet now. Um, and I know that Janet is very well versed in experience overseas and what has been done in Europe um, to address stakeholder issues. Um, so could you um, give us some benefit of your experience there? Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Happily. Um, I mean, the big sort of difference between um, our own corporate governance system and those of continental Europe is that in the vast majority of European countries, they have requirements for worker directors on company boards or at any rate, some form of workforce voice within corporate governance. Um, the, you know, in a nutshell, we can sort of see from these experiences is that, is that it works um, and generates you know both economic value but also social benefits as well um, so countries that have got strong workers participation rights perform better on a whole range of factors including r d expenditure employment rates also achieving at the same time lower rates of poverty and inequality and um, strikingly you know very relevant for the uk given our particular problems of low investment and low productivity r d expenditure is twice as high as a percentage in of gdp in countries with strong rights for workers participation um i mean this is something that the qc has campaigned for for many years um you know we believe that um, kind of worker voice on company boards is another important part of corporate governance reform. Um, we know that greater diversity on company boards improves the quality of decision making and there's been rightly an emphasis on gender diversity and to some extent uh, now um, kind of ethnic diversity, but there's been much less emphasis on social diversity. Um, and you know, and, and, and a focus on bringing people with a wider range of backgrounds into um, in, in, into the boardroom and into decision making. Um, and you know, what worker directors would do as well as bringing greater diversity, they bring their operational knowledge of the company, including, of course, their experience of workforce relationships and, and how they work, um, since that's an element that's critical for company success. Um, all in all, you know, bringing, have the ability to bring a great contribution into um, company decision making. Um, research shows that the contribution of worker directors um, where it's in place is valued by other directors. I mean, there's a few companies in the UK that do have worker directors and that's very clear with those companies, they value it highly. It's also clear from, you know, much larger scale sort of research that's taken place um, in Europe as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I fully agree that reforming directors duties is a sort of critical starting point for corporate governance reform uh, but bringing um, you know sort of widening the the voices in corporate decision making and uh, specifically worker directors on company boards is another reform that we would like to see um being brought in sort of hand in hand with that thanks very much janet um and i'd just like to point out that we have quite a lot of parliamentary on the um, discussion. Um, so if any of them would like to um, uh, make um, take this opportunity to ask a quick question, then please just um, flag it up in the chat um, section. Uh, before we do that, we'll turn to Chris now, um, given that we're talking about experience from overseas, um, and we can um, talk to him about the um, B corporations and how they have improved um, the approach to stakeholder interests. Thanks. Thanks, Deborah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, many of you on, on the line will be aware this, this, the, the sort of story of the, um, the Better Business Act, you know, interesting hearing, you know, Roger used the, you, you know, say that we're on a journey, you know, and, and this is sort of the next stop. In many ways, you know, it's a similar story with the B Corporation movement, you know, this sto the story here of the campaign starts with the B Corporation movement. It certainly doesn't end with the B Corporation, you know, it ends ultimately, as, as we're saying, with a kind of default change. But we have the roots there in the heritage of, of B, the B Corp movement and everything that we've learned through those experiences. And, and some of you will know the B Corp movement well, some of you won't. But over the last 10 to 15 years, um, the B Corp movement has been working hard to ultimately prove the model here. Um, and to, to prove the model, both in, in the sense of kind of corporate governance um, around the world, um, the B Corp movement has been involved in, in developing benefit corporation legislation, which some of you may be familiar with. So um, corporate forms, 
which embody these principles, which are an option in various places around the world, whether that's um, 40 odd states in the US, whether it's the Enterprise of Mission form in, in France or, or formed in Italy and other countries. So, so proving that this works as an option um, it, it has been a crucial part of that. Also within the UK itself, um, the B Corps in the UK of which there are over 500 have to make a legal change as well. So they change their articles of association, which is something UK businesses can do, a relatively little known feature of the current 172. Um, but UK B Corps do that, again, enshrining the same kind of principles that we're talking about here in their specific case. And in doing so, um, in all of the B Corps changing their governance in that way. And furthermore, the thousands, many thousands of businesses that are making, adopting these forms of corporate governance without becoming B Corps, um, they're proving in doing so that this is a good basis for decision making in the interests of all stakeholders. They're proving that this is a powerful way of empowering directors, liberating directors of businesses to make these decisions. Um, they're, they're proving also that this is now also reflecting from a governance perspective. Um, investors preferences and capital flows you know they're proving actually over the last year or so that this is also a great governance framework for thinking about challenges and responding and resilience in the face of unexpected pressures um so really the story here with b corps is the proof point it's, it's demonstrating that and actually we did a little bit of research um at the end of last year looking at comparing uk b corp smes with the wider UK SME um, community. And, and pulling out of that research, we've got incredible stories and data to show that um, the, the businesses that have adopted this governance framework, they're growing faster in terms of turnover, in terms of employee growth, they've got better retention, better diversity to some of Janet's points. Um, far more going on in terms of innovation. Um, and of course, they're also, as mentioned, really successful in attracting um, investment. So it's this body of evidence that we've really created over the past, as I say, past sort of 10, 15 years, which now provides obviously an amazing platform for us to say, why not um, for every business? Because that's what we need. Yes, absolutely. Um, my former employer, The Guardian, has um, become a B Corp as well. So uh, <laughs> I've um, got direct experience from that. Um, so Luke, um, just turning to you now um, in on the legal side of things, do we really, do we actually need to change the law if people are doing it anyway? I think you have some businesses who are leading the way, who as Roger was describing, are thinking about these things in a very rich way, who, who are aware of the ways in which stakeholders and relationships with stakeholders affect shareholder value. But that's really only a part of the story and, and not by any stretch, uh, you know, the, the sort of central part of the story. And so I think if we want to see uh, a shift in the way that the law describes fiduciary duty in a way that actually catches up with the best of the thinking and the best of, of the practice around, then I don't think we've really got much choice other than to look at, at that, that bedrock um, in section 172, which really shapes uh, the world view that, that boards have. And boards might not necessarily know that, they might not necessarily be thinking about section 172, but it's, it's you know, it's, it's in a sense shaping market practice, shaping advice, shaping the way that lawyers think about these things, regulators think about these things. So unless you get right down to that, that foundation, I don't think you can really solve the puzzle or, uh, you know, unlock um, the issues. Uh, and so from my perspective, if, if we can, get to the purpose, the default purpose of the company, and we can broaden that and say, well, actually, we now think that companies exist not only for their shareholders, but actually to create a broader benefit for society and the environment. Suddenly, all sorts of other things become possible within the wider legal and regulatory system. And I think you, you then start to see regulators thinking differently. You start to see policymakers thinking differently, and, and lots of things flow from it. And I think it's easy to sort of look back and say, well, look at the things that have happened since 2006, the financial crisis, the pandemic, what we know about climate change. But then if you look forward and you look at these commitments that are being made to net zero in 2050, that's a long road. And uh, at the moment, people are making those commitments, but they're not uh, transparently describing how they're decarbonizing. They don't have um, medium term scientific targets. 
And if we want to see that sort of practice emerge, then I think we need to shift the, the legal framework so that we can facilitate it. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, just to um, add um, to that, um, I'm just wondering if there is, um, is there a trade-off between profits and stakeholder interests? Um, if companies, they, they obviously want to make a profit, but can they um, also have regard to their stakeholder interests? Should we turn to Roger for that one? Well, I think um, it, it, it's absolutely the case that you could take a very short term perspective and just want to make as much money as you can in the short term, which you extract from the company um, at the expense of the other stakeholders. Um, but I think if you're talking about a long a company who wants to be a long term sustainable business, then I think the the interests of the stakeholders, the interests of shareholders become much more aligned. Um, so and you, you it's, it's hard to conceive that you could actually be a long term successful business without really having excellent relationships with, with, with stakeholders. But I think we just have to recognize that, um, um, you know, there are many different types of business, business interests and shareholders also are not homogeneous. There are many different kinds. And I think what a change in the law in this way would achieve is it would sort of orientate all shareholders and all companies more in line with best practice and, and, with, and, and would encourage a long-term sustainable approach. Um, let's also um, remember that uh, shareholders are becoming more engaged as well. As a former colleague of mine has mentioned in the chat, Richard Tompkins says, um, look at the Deliveroo flotation. Shareholders were very engaged there with the um, employment practices of Deliveroo. Um, so there is, uh, not all shareholders are, are um, destructive or, or rampageous um, for short-term profits. Um, so um, what, what would good look like? I mean, Janet, what can we say um, good would be? Um, what are we aiming for? Well, I think the crucial thing is what we're aiming for ultimately is a shift in business practice. Um, you know, the, the aim is not in itself a change in the law or better reporting or, you know, this or that. We actually want companies to, um, to refocus themselves and orient themselves differently um, in terms of how they treat their stakeholders um, you know in terms of the workforce that means um, wherever possible you know direct employment not indirect employment where people's rights are very severely restricted um, it means better levels of pay I mean the the the, the um, proportion of, of GDP um, going to workers going to wages have has you know kind of shrunk um quite significantly since the sort of the mid 70s and ultimately that you know it's bad for working people it's actually also bad for the economy because it you know cuts into sort of consumer demand as well so wages um need particularly at the bottom end uh, need to be raised obviously you know it's a difficult moment right now but that's been an issue for quite a long time um in the uk um so those are key things. We also need much better um, information and consultation. I mean, this is an area that we, you know, there's very, very clear evidence of the impact of, of workforce sort of engagement and involvement on company performance. But, you know, nonetheless, it's not something we're particularly good at in the UK. Um, and, you know, too many companies don't sort of really take it, you know, uh, engage with their workforce at all. Or if they do, they just sort of, you know, they, they do it badly. and. Um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that um, collective voice um, makes a strong contribution both to the kind of well-being of the workforce, which in itself, um, you know, makes people more motivated and, and reduces absenteeism, but also has a sort of direct um, impact on things like, um, you know, innovation, um, which might not be expected, but, you know, is the case because in, in a sense, everybody is, you know, contributing more fully. Um, so I think that that's what we're that's what we're aiming for. Um, as everyone has been saying, there are some companies who do operate very well already in relation to their stakeholders, but there are too many that don't. Um, and one point I just wanted to make, kind of following on something that I think Roger was 
was saying, I, I completely agree. You know, we know, I think there's very strong evidence that in the long term, there is a, a very um, good convergence of stakeholder interests with those of investors and other stakeholders. But that is not enough to mean that companies actually operate in that way. Um, and I think that's an argument that certainly we've come up against in this area, you know, time and time again, people can kind of say, well, if there is a business case, then why do you need to change the law? Why isn't everybody doing it? And the fact is there is a strong business case, but people don't all do it. And we do need to change the law because that would just bring everybody up to the same place, the same page. It wouldn't have, you know, the idea it would be bad for the economy is, I think, completely misguided. The evidence is entirely the other way. It would be good for the economy and it would bring, you know, significant social um, benefits as, as well, you know, to workers, to other state and other stakeholders. So, yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, and Chris wants to come in on this one. Also, Chris, while you're um, talking, um, could you just sum up whether this is going to be a huge change, um, making this change to the Companies Act, or is it just a small t tweak around the edges? Absolutely. Yeah, I can I can say a word on that. And I might also then hand it off to Luke to say a word on that as well, because I Luke and I have had that that conversation. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to briefly come in on, on you know, what does good look like? Um, because I think, um, you know, there's a, you know, in many ways, um, we are driven, you know, we're, we're really driven um, with this um, campaign by the urgency of the challenges we face. And, and I think, you know, oftentimes that can get this conversation off on a, on a sort of, you know, a fairly, you know, sinister note, you know, we're sort of, you know, this kind of doom laden um, picture that we paint. But of course, you know, the, 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 the great thing here and the sort of the, the optimistic future ultimately that we want to paint is all rooted in the fact that, that there are many, many businesses who are doing this and who, who ultimately are demonstrating what good looks like. Um, and, and I wanted to, to, there was some great comments in the chat, just, just as um, Janet was, was reflecting on this one as well. Um, people highlighting the fact that yes, B Corps have been demonstrating this, but also I know we've got, we've got um, some people from the Employee Ownership Association on, on the call. We've got Social Enterprise UK, we've got the cooperative movement, we've got businesses signed up to the weights principles. You know, there's a whole range of businesses who are bringing to the table great examples of, of ultimately um, benefiting a wide range of stakeholders and doing that every day. And what I think all those examples help us do is navigate the way from what can seem quite a sort of in many to, to many years, a sort of esoteric arcane kind of conversation about, um, you know, about corporate governance into something which is very real and tangible when they think about the businesses that they work for or that they buy from or that they invest in. Um, and that's that's ultimately just bringing us to the, the Better Business Act campaign. That's one of our jobs is to bring this to life for people, um, ultimately what it feels like and what it looks like in an individual company basis. But also then as you start thinking about the system and you start thinking about every business behaving in this way, the positive vision um, that that can give us of, of, of the, um, you know, that relationship between business and society and how we help to hope to heal that and, and, and really kind of deliver for, for all stakeholders. So just a, a thought there on what, what good looks like. And then, um, yeah, is it a, is it a big change? Is it a minor tweak? I, I think the, um, you know, you'll, you'll get, you'll get, we already have got different perspectives on this. I think when you speak to different people, um, I think one of the things that comes through very strongly as we speak to, um, leaders in business about this is that it is it, it is big in what it um it is big in terms of what it symbolizes um you know the reframing of decision making the culture and conversation in the boardroom that's big and when you think about that happening at the default level it's really big um so that's big and it, it's big and it's important it's important because it's big and it's big because it's important um but of course it's also um, a minor tweak in that it doesn't instantly result in a whole range of new, you know, a whole new burden and range of range of kind of um, obligations for business leaders. So in that sense, we hope to achieve sort of the best of best of both worlds in making quite a kind of clear statement about the way that business needs to operate and the responsibilities they need to be held to, um, while also giving the room for lots of the stuff that will follow in the wake of the Better Business Act, 
um, to, to ultimately be kind of aligned with this direction, but be done and developed in consultation with business. So that's, I think, the right balance between big change and minor tweak. Yes, great. Thank you. Um, also, quite a few comments in the chat about it being a younger generation of business leaders who really have taken up this mantle. And I like that idea that we're now bringing in new people who have new ideas. Um, and I'm sorry um, not to um, turn to any of our other panellists, but um, we are out of time on this section. Um, and um, I'd just like to thank all of the panelists for a very interesting, um, stimulating discussion and hand over now to Caroline Lucas, MP. Thank you uh, very much. And thank you to Chris and Karen at Beacor for the invitation to take part in this event. And my sincere apologies for not being here um, at the very start of the meeting. I hope it doesn't seem too rude. I will catch up with the recording afterwards, but I was at an environmental audit select committee um, for our session on, on community energy. And we were hearing evidence from from groups, community energy groups and so forth. And it, it struck me really that energy is an area full of, of innovators who are putting people and planet at the very heart of their business model, as well as many admittedly who, who certainly are not yet. But as we see in other sectors, I think what's exciting is that there is an ecosystem of both for profit and not for profit companies who are embracing new operating models for the 21st century. And I think the climate and ecological emergency means that such businesses must become the norm rather than the exception. And that needs to happen really fast. So that's one of the reasons I'm so delighted to support the campaign for a Better Business Act. It is a, a, a beautiful piece of, of legislative drafting, modest changes to the statute book, but potentially a transformative impact. And transformation is, is absolutely what we need. Because in terms of the economic recovery plans we're seeing from governments so far, I think they are failing this transformation test badly. Too often they're doubling down on outdated and dangerous ideology that prioritizes economic growth rather than the health and well-being of people and planet. The Better Business Act is one example of businesses coming together and they understand the need for a system upgrade as B Corp have called it. The act itself will help unlock the transformative change that we need in a really tangible way. And that matters because the actions and decisions of business leaders are more critical than ever before, I think, in addressing the climate emergency. Partly through what a business provides and, and how it operates, and that's clearly a hugely powerful part of the contribution that businesses can make, as B Corp shows, the real world proof of concept, the art of the possible, the practical action in place of, of political rhetoric. But of course, another powerful role that businesses can play is around lobbying. I appreciate that's quite a, a topical issue right now, not necessarily for the right reasons, but there are some very practical and positive examples of businesses coming together to lobby for ambitious change. And I would cite the example of last year, over 200 UK businesses and investors writing to the prime minister, calling for a recovery which meets commitments to tackle the climate crisis and increases resilience to, to future environmental shocks. And that is hugely powerful when you've got those businesses coming together to say, hang on a minute, we can do better than this, you know, set the regulatory framework such that all of us have to do more. Responsible Travel is a company in my constituency in Brighton, for example, and it's been campaigning hard for a green flying duty to manage demand with revenues ring fenced for investment into lower carbon transport. Sadly, though, you don't need to look very hard for the contrasting headlines. The fact that 65% of directors from the world's top banks have connections to polluting industries and lobby groups who are obstructing climate change or that, sorry, climate change action, or that logistics brands push adverts about going green, but at the same time, they remain members or funders of lobby groups that are working to delay or water down clean air measures in cities across the UK. Or there are examples of pesticides manufacturers, major consumers of fossil fuels with a, a major responsibility for an insect apocalypse. And, and they're trying to persuade politicians that their products are a solution to climate change. So it is brilliant to see businesses themselves at the front of the Better Business Act campaign. And in terms of what the act itself offers, I don't think we can overestimate the positive impact of every single company in the UK, whether big or small, taking ownership of its social and environmental impact 
free from the shackles of short-term shareholder primacy. And in a way, there's a parallel with government here. It makes no sense for some departments or ministers to be striving hard to align policy with UK climate and nature goals, whilst at the same time, others are pursuing policies that directly undermine them. For example, by encouraging investment in high carbon infrastructure or granting tax breaks to fossil fuels, often justified on the grounds of being good for growth. So similarly, the Better Business Act will help ensure that the actions taken by some businesses to tackle the climate crisis aren't undermined or cancelled out by others continuing with an outdated, extractive and exploitative business model. No longer should a company be seen as less successful by paying as much, if not more, attention to impacts on people and planet as on profit margins. And in turn, and in turn no longer should our economies be judged as successful or not on the basis of GDP growth figures. But instead, it should be on the extent to which they are meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. So in summary, I'm delighted that the campaign for the Better Business Act shows that businesses have woken up to this and in many ways are far ahead of ministers on the transformation that we need. So I just wanna end by thanking again, B Corp and everyone involved in this brilliant initiative and for this opportunity to add my, my voice as a strong supporter of the campaign. And I very much look forward to working with members of, of parliament from all parties to get these proposals onto the statute book as fast as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that. And a, a, a brilliant um, sort of galvanizing call for urgency there for, for us as well. Um, I want to yeah thank Caroline, but I also want to thank all of our all of our speakers, um, our parliamentarians, our experts. It's been been brilliant to to have you with us through this conversation. Um, we've held um, we've held everyone's attention. It looks like um, through over an hour, which is brilliant. So I'll bring us to a swift close. Um, I think we've got a slide to bring up, which is just going to give you all or remind you all of the um, the website address. Um, and our um, social media handles so that you can do whatever it is people do on social media, all the sharing and, and tweeting and things. Um, so please do that. Um, you know, as, as Douglas said at the very beginning, this is, you know, we've, we've, we've got some incredible momentum behind us with these businesses on board. Um, and, and, and a really, as, as, as Caroline was saying, a really expertly crafted um, piece, of, piece of legislation here, which, we, which we're basing um, our principles on and, 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 and our ask on. So we, we're really off on the front foot, um, but it is the beginning now of a conversation um, to make this happen and to make this happen quickly and together with as many of you um, and your colleagues as possible. So please do spread the word, um, sign up your business or, or your, your friends and colleagues businesses, um, follow us, um, supporters, and, and of course, get in touch at the email address there or if, if, you, have, if you have our email addresses as well um, to pick up the conversation because we really look forward to, to speaking with you all. And um, with that, thank you and goodbye.